And what I'd love to begin with first is we're normally in podcasts, we kind of get into people's stories a little bit, but today we're just going to hang around some topics. And the first topic is what I've been digging into this a little bit myself lately. When people come to yoga, do you think, or what do you want to provide? There's two options. There is an education, like people are going to school and you're, you're, they're there to learn something to go deep. Or then the other school of thought is you're there to be, like help people have a good time, right. like have a nice experience. And it's very hard to do both of those things. I'm, my bias is more education. Like, I don't really want people to have fun, necessarily. <laughs> and I guess, what's your thoughts on that, on that kind of idea? Well, I'm somewhere in the middle, I think. Um, I, I'm a very strict teacher. I'm quite a disciplinarian, but I do, I actually use a phrase when I'm teaching and I say, thanks for coming, we're going to have some serious fun. Okay. So I try to be educational. I try to teach what my teachers have taught me. And I also try to have fun at the same time. But as a caveat to that, I'm really, really strict. And a lot of people don't come back to my classes because it is too strict. <laughs> and I just say, well, you better find in a different teacher because that was <laughs> the way I was taught. So I try to, um, I try to... I try to pass on what knowledge I've acquired in the last 25 odd years, and, but have fun as well. And you have to tread a really fine line between attracting people to come into yoga, maybe for their first time or they're new to it, and putting them off yoga. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure <laughs> I've put a few people <laughs> off. But you don't have to be like everything to everyone, do you? Because like no. when, when did you f feel that you found the freedom to be the teacher that you wanted to be? When I stopped being a Jiva Mukti teacher. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I'm a Jiva. I, would, I started with Ashtanga, and then the only way we could train was through Shivananda. Um, so everyone in the 90s ended up being a Shivananda teacher, but we never taught Shivananda. <laughs> we taught Ashtanga Vinyasa Mysore to classes. Um, and then I, did, I became, I moved to New York, and I became a Jiva teacher. And I had to teach. When they asked me to teach, uh, I'd been with them maybe. I'd known David and John since the ni early 90s, late 80s. And um, they asked us to teach a spiritual warrior sequence. And they asked us to teach certain sequences we'd learned on training. And then I thought, well, I don't really want to do this. <laughs> I've done Ashtanga Vinyasa Mysore where I did the same sequence every day for 12 years. And I want to teach yoga now. I just want to teach my yoga. I'm old enough and wise enough. And I'm going to teach what I want to teach mm. and not what corporate yoga tells me how to did teach. that go, how did that go down <laughs> great yeah great yeah i felt <laughs> really liberated and i became uh, i left jiva i stopped teaching at jiva mukti and i stopped labeling my classes everyone in the yoga business always get asked you know what it's like to label your class yeah, yeah but what type of yoga is it what should we put on the schedule and i said well just yoga and they said yeah but what type of yoga and i said there only is one yoga. <laughs> yeah. And they went, what do you mean? There's hundreds of yogas. And I said, yeah, but there's only one feeling of yoga. There's only one experience of yoga you ever get in your life. There's many ways to get that experience, but there's only one yoga. Yeah. So I'm just teaching yoga from now on. And even though it might be dynamic, it might be vinyasa based, it might be ashtanga based, it's what I, my experience gave to me from my teachers. And you know, even, I was just going to say, even if we do label the yoga, it often means nothing, unless it's like a, a Bikram class where mm. it is almost a script. Like if you go to a vinyasa class, yeah. there's a massive spectrum of what it could be, depending totally. entirely on the teacher. Yep. And it's always, it's always dependent on the teacher, isn't it? Totally, really? yeah. Totally. If, you, if you're aware of vinyasa classes, the, the whole lineage of it comes from Krishnamacharya. And Krishnamacharya taught much more than uh, Ashtanga Vinyasa Mysore, mm. much more than what Patabi Joyce made his name for. There was, if you look at Krishnamacharya's studies and you look at the way he links postures together with breath, you g it gives you a freedom to do whatever you want. Once you, as long as you have the, as long as you maintain the correct intention, and it's a yogic intention, hmm. you could um, you could go for a walk in the woods and that's yoga. As long as you've got the correct intention, and we do that with our teachers. Sometimes we go for a silent walk in the woods. We don't speak. We don't communicate with each other. We just walk silently. And to be honest. Personally, I find that a lot more yoga than doing um, gymnastics or acrobatics <laughs> or <laughs> whatever else people are selling as yoga these days. Plus, I've got a problem with um, corporate yoga. 
So one of the lines that I use a lot in class is, you might find this quite offensive, some of you, but I don't think there's such a thing <laughs> as yin yoga. I don't think there's such a thing as yin yoga. I don't think there's such a thing as, a, uh, as jiva mukti yoga or fierce grace or bikram yoga or any other, the corporate yogas, dru yoga, kripalu yoga. These are all yogas I've come across all over the world, but they're all corporations. They're all businesses run by people to promote their brand. And I've studied maybe... 30, 40 yoga texts, and none of them mention yin yoga. <laughs> <laughs> none of them mention jiva mukti yoga. What about face yoga? You see any face yoga? There's no face yoga mentioned. There's no <laughs> laughing yoga. There's no goat yoga. There's no dog yoga. If you go to Brighton, you can do find a partner yoga. <laughs> so you can actually have good sexual relations from meeting someone in a yoga class. That's not in the Upanishads, and it's not in the, in the Vedas or in any of the Shastras. I, I got dragged in about eight Valentine's Days ago <laughs> by a studio telling me to do a Valentine's Day workshop. <laughs> a party, oh, it was the worst <laughs> evening of my life. It, everything oh. about it was cringe. Holly, sorry. What are your views on, because uh, I know you're a music lover and I love playing music in classes, but there's a, you know, some people believe that playing music takes away from the experience of yoga and other people think it enhances it, like me. So what are your views yeah, on yeah. that? Um, all the questions you've asked me so far, I'm pretty proud to sit on the fence. Because <laughs> um, one thing I learned from my university education, my academic education and studying Buddhism for a while and not yoga, was that there has to be a middle path. Yeah. And um, I found the middle path with yoga as well. Um, and I found it with music and I found it with my teaching and I found it basically ha having fun or educating. It's the same with music. Mm -hmm. I went through a period when I lived in New York and I lived in, I lived in Maui teaching for a year. And um, I lived in New York teaching and all the DJ and all the musicians from Run DMC and everybody <laughs> who came to class and all the DJs, they wanted wicked playlists. So I sat for hours with my computer and I made playlists and they were all timed to the asana. Mm. So I knew exactly <laughs> in my sequence when to play Michael Franti. I knew in my sequence when to play Brian Eno. I knew in my sequence when to play reggae or dub. And now I don't play anything. <laughs> I play a weird shitty record usually in <laughs> shoulder stand for a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> so I choose a real crap record that everyone knows. Crap in inverted commas because like at the moment, last, la last record I did this with was Sinead O'Connor, Nothing Compares to You. Beautiful. And I put it on in shoulder stand and everyone sang their hearts out. Aww. So I turned it off and they sang without the music. <laughs> I do it with Stevie Wonder. I do it with the Beatles. I can only do it with things that children know and people know. Otherwise, if I put on something really like highbrow, no one knows the words. <laughs> but everyone knows the words to Stevie Wonder. Yeah. I just called to say I love you. Everyone knows the words Aww. to certain ABBA songs. So in shoulder stand for a laugh, I <laughs> turn the music up and I put on a really bad record. Bad in inverted <laughs> commas. So yesterday it was the Carpenters sing because I love the Carpenters and she was the best drummer in the world. And I can also teach people about diet if I talk about carpenters and going to excessive limits with your diet and how having body dysmorphia through, feed, uh, through food and the, um, through bulimia and anorexia can be put into something in shoulder stand. Just by playing her record, you can talk about that. The same way I played Lena Zavaroni once. No one knows who Lena Zavaroni is, but she died the same way as Karen Carpenter. And she comes from very close to where I come from. So I knew her, I knew her family. When she died, she was three and a half stone. Oh so I God. can actually make a oh social gosh. comment by playing a record like The Carpenters or Lena Zavaroni. And um, that sort of goes over a lot of people's yes, head. Yeah. But I very rarely play drum and bass anymore, even though sometimes I will play LTJ Bookham when I'm doing sun salutations. <laughs> but I don't have playlists because it goes back to when I was doing Ashtanga. And when I go, I teach quite a lot in India now, and no one, you don't use music in India. No one uses music mm. in asana class. It's, it's verboten. You don't do it. Kirtan and bhajan are separate from yeah. asana. So um, it's a, a bit of both, really, still. Thank and you. I bet people like Run DMC wouldn't have started yoga in the first place if there wasn't a banging playlist. But my, my view not, is, yeah. I'm kind of not quite on the fence. I don't play music particularly. If I play it, it's just like a vague piano playlist that you can barely hear, just kind of holding the space. Yeah, yeah. My view is, if I, if I wanted to meditate, meditate will be f meditating would be far more fun if I watch TV. Yeah. But 100% it detracts from meditation. Yeah, yeah. And equally, if I play music when I meditate, it's yeah. fun, 
And I think it's the same in yoga. Yeah, you can't yeah. go as deep. With the asana class, I found um, I used to smoke a lot of dope. I mean, I smoked a lot of pot and I <laughs> took a lot of drugs when I was younger. And I, a lot of people come to my class, you can see that some of them still smoke dope and they're coming down from drugs and they've had drug experiences. When those people are in your class and you've got music on, they don't listen to you, they listen to the music. Yeah. And they trip out on the music. And I, as a dope smoker, I used to do that all the time. <laughs> I'd be like that, wow, this is wicked. I'm gonna stay in children's stand for three minutes and listen to John Coltrane. I love John Coltrane, I love Pharaoh Saunders, I love Miles Davis. I'm uh, meant to be doing a posture. Yeah. <laughs> I'm meant to be concentrating <laughs> on yoga, not listening to the music. So I know firsthand that dope smokers, when they come to your class, have got a terrible propensity to listen to the music and not yeah. listen to you and not listen to themselves and learn about themselves. On that note, <laughs> so music, so mu people like, I'm the same. If our music's playing, I'll listen to the lyrics. You tend to do like kind of Dharma talks or talks on kind of current affairs, etc. through yeah. class. How would you say, does that detract or add and how, how would you mindfully integrate those conversations into class yeah. without yeah. it taken away? Um, I try to integrate, I start with the basic premise that I'm a, and I'm, a, I'm a radical vegan, I'm an animal activist, so I always integrate Ahimsa, and Ahimsa being the first Yama, I'll always stress that everyone practicing yoga should be a vegan, otherwise you'll never experience yoga properly if you aren't a vegan, because the first Yama is the first Yama, you don't harm any sentient being, so Patanjali lists 10 things that you should do to experience yoga. You can do yoga by all means, but then I'll integrate um, vegan lifestyle, vegan diet, animal rights, animal activism, and that will lead me probably into Sosha if I get to the Niyamas. And Sosha relate to e eco and environmental issues and climate change issues. So I can, while I'm teaching asana, I try to integrate everything from Ahimsa all the way through the 10 Yamas and Niyamas and integrate it into modern thinking. If you read them, um, People like Matthew Remsky and other mm. people have integrated a different view to the, to the sutras and to the yamas, and I try to remain faithful to Patanjali's teachings while I'm teaching a physical asana class. Mm -hmm. And that can be political, social political, environmental, moral, as you say, dharma, a dharma, yeah. my, my own dharma. And I manage to do that while I'm teaching gymnastics <laughs> <laughs> and you speak about yoga as being an act of service yes, can you speak to can you speak mm. to that yeah so a lot of people say why your classes if you if you're not um if you're not keen on teaching gymnastics and physical uh, prowess why are you teaching a really hard physical class and uh, and my answer to that is because it's what i do and i do it so i can be strong and healthy to look after my grandchildren my family my friends so in yoga we call it seva so you should be a sevak. So it's not about your health, it's about your, f your physicality to be able to help other people. So if I'm sick and ill, and I'm poorly, and someone has to look after me, they have to be in service to me. I don't want that to happen, and I don't want my yoga practitioners to, they w I want them to be in service. Mm. So I say to them, if you do my class, and you physically go through these asana, pranayama, dhyana and mantra and you teach the four practical and practice the four practical aspects of ashtanga then you'll always be a good sevak you'll always be fit and healthy and you'll be there to help someone you'll be there when people need you they won't have to look after you you'll be able to look after them and for me from what i've learned in india like that's the whole purpose of life is to be in service mm. for other people and not the other way about it's because I've been the other way about. I've been when I've been helpless and people have had to look after me and I tried to not let that happen again. Mm. So mm -hmm. I think, sir, I don't think many yoga teachers do they? I don't know, I don't go to many classes. <laughs> but the yoga teachers mention Seva. I think if you, if I've been to a few. So, Radic, so we had a, a guest recently called Radhika Das. Right. So Kirtan leader. And yeah. he was all, he's all about that. Yeah. My, uh, when I knew Ram Das, Ram Das used to always wear a Seva t-shirt. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah, and uh, a lot of that school of yoga practitioners maybe the same as I think a few so I think Michael Wong actually whose face is there he teaches one of his modules is just sever right yeah, and yeah. that's yeah so it's still it's still there yeah, it's yeah. still there somewhere so on my teacher training I have one module which is sever stroke karma so they have to do um, 30 hours okay. uh, in the voluntary sector amazing and you have to have it um, accredited 
so they get the 30 hours towards the teacher training. I've never heard of a training gym. That's a nice. Mm. I've That's done a really that nice three advanced teacher trainings. This is my third one. I've done Karma Stroke Seva. So they go and do, they do Mind or Save the Children yeah. or they do another local charity or they just help someone in the street who might be have accessibility problems or disabled problems and then they come back with a signed proof that they've done it and I give them the credit to mm. the teacher training. What a nice thing to incorporate. Yeah. You mentioned before you uh, that you said I think walking through the woods could be the yoga. Yeah. And I wonder like, what's your view on the difference between a informal and a formal practice? So when mm. I say formal I mean kind of sitting down and meditating, yeah, yeah. chanting, asana and then when people say oh my yoga practice today was my walk. So actually mm. you I think you kind of still need a formal practice. You can't yeah, yeah. just you can't just forever say everything is your yoga. Mm. Well, there's a very well-known yoga academic called Jim Mallinson, and um, he was one of my lecturers at SOAS during my masters. And um, Jim actually gave me one really good thing from the years of study with him is that everything you do in life is yoga. Everything, everything. So yes, there is a formal practice, but. I always say to people when they leave my class, you can go and do yoga now. That was not yoga. You were just doing yogasana. Mm. You were maybe doing one pranayama. You weren't even doing proper pranayama. You were just doing <laughs> one ujjayi <laughs> breath. So you did a tiny little bit of yoga. So now it's up to you to go into your daily life and do yoga mm. and practice yoga. So I'm very much like yoga is, is, is a life thing. Oh. It's yes. not a form of practice. And I know lots of people who don't go to asana class who don't have a formal practice, they maybe meditate and do some pranayama and that's all they do. Mm. But I know they're practicing yoga all day long. But do you, do you think their, their formal practice or whatever that looked like helped inform them oh, being yeah, able yeah, to yeah. deliver initially? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah one came first and then the other yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what usually happens, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like uh, Jörg Fjörstein, okay. the, the author who's now passed. Jörg Fjörstein wrote 23 books on yoga, the most prolific modern day writer on yoga. And he never did any asana at the end. He, he thought asana were completely a wrong thing to do. Mm. <laughs> so he, it's, I did his advanced teacher training before he passed. And um, he was always of the opinion that yoga, modern yoga was gymnastics and he'd shy away from it. But he's the one who always went for a walk in the woods. Mm. Okay. He's the one that always went into life. He wrote a book called Yoga, Mor yoga Morality, okay. which is one of his last books. And it's a really poignant book on how yoga is what you do from the minute you wake up to the minute you go to sleep. What's his name again? Jorg. Jorg. G E O R G. Yeah. Fjörstein. F E F E U E R S T E I N. Fjörstein. Okay. People have to look him up. He's written 28, 28 books, yeah. 23 books. <laughs> okay. The Encyclopedia of Yoga and Tantra, which is the common teacher training book that we use. You you mentioned lots of trainings. How, like, do you still? I guess you know every teacher wants to see themselves still as a student. Do you mm. still embark on trainings, or what? What do you study in your? A, at the moment, I'm studying. I'm a PhD candidate at SUAS, oh, yeah, right. and I'm doing um, Hindutva, modern Hind. Well, Hindutva, which is a right-wing extreme form of uh, Hinduism, and non-violence in oh. connection with yoga. And that would be what four or five year commitment. Um, I've got. I just done my first year, so I've got another up to three to four years. Yeah. yeah. And will you go by doctor? Do you think? Uh, I don't think so. No. <laughs> 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 uh, what does your uh, your personal practice look like then? You said you don't go to many other teachers' classes. Do you have a formal practice? Looks practice? A bit like what I teach. Right, on your own. Five A's, five B's, standing postures, triangles, balances, forward bends, back bends, few inversions, yoga nidra mm. with a ten minute meditation at the beginning of every class. So I do dhyana. My own practice is the exact same as what I teach, otherwise I wouldn't feel correct yeah. to teach it. Mm. Mm. Um, it's maybe not as dynamic as some of the people who I teach who are very much into calisthenics and mm -hmm. into doing that mm -hmm. sort of yoga at the moment. Mm -hmm. But it's about an hour, the asana about an hour and 20, an hour and a half every morning. Wow. The meditation 20 minutes and the pranayama 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I got my own studio, so I live in my own studio. I built my own studio. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. What would you say, so you've trained lots of teachers and you've seen lots of kind of up and coming teachers. Would there be any advice you would give to someone? Like, not business advice, but teachers trying to find their path. Because often you do your first teacher training, yeah. you often kind of mimic whatever that you palette, what they've taught yeah. you, and you know you become one of many people teaching the same thing. Yeah. How would you advise people to find their path and access as many people as they can with the teachings? Um, 
I would advise people not to do a teacher training until they practice between four and six years minimum. And I would advise people not to even mention they've done a 200 hour teacher training because 200 hour <laughs> teacher training is just a complete and utter farce. Um, <laughs> anybody, who, anybody who professes to be a yoga teacher after 200 hour training is just, uh, is just a bogus yoga teacher. So I do minimum 300 hours to my introduction, but I prefer that they've done 500 hours before they teach. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to work out a system where I only give them my blessings to teach when I'm happy that they can teach, because I've taught between four and 500 teachers, and I think about 30 or 40 of them are any good. <laughs> the rest of them gave me money, and I think if they think if they give you the money, they'll give you they'll, you'll give them a certificate. Yeah. And I don't, I was, me and Joey Miles were the first two people in Britain to refuse people certificates. So you, you've only given 30 people certificates? You've given more? No, than I've given five, almost 400 okay. people. <laughs> 200 hour certificates. Okay. I don't see, I did 200 hour Shivananda in Naya Dam 20 odd years ago. And um, all you had to do was be there. You keep never had keep to breathing, anything. as long as you keep breathing. As long as you just sit there and clean out the toilets every day, you get a certificate. <laughs> but then you can go home to London and teach yoga. And I always was amazed by that. I always was yeah, I think I think the YMCA is like a 10 hour course there now. There was one man who did Jiva Mukti 300 hour and he'd only actually done asanas for three days before he did the teacher training. Wow. Oh wow. He'd only I, done asana for I, three I days. I think that's quite common. For, I know a few people that have done that. You know, they've been in Goa anyway. Mm and just kind of fancied it yeah. while they were there. Like, just extend the holiday for an extra two yeah. grand and suddenly... It's the same in Rishikesh. You okay. can do it for £800 and do it in Amazing. 12 days and get a certificate. <laughs> yeah. And so what, do you, what qualities make a good teacher? As far as you're concerned, when you're looking for the, what, the, the 20, 30 you've just said that are good, mm. and you can't get to their classes all the time, so you, but in, what are you getting a sense of when you see them teach once or twice? Um, that they, they follow what they've been taught and that they practice. I find a lot of modern yoga teachers don't practice. Mm. And I've, I really insist that they must have a, a, a 28 days a month practice. They practice every day apart from a moon day, or they take one day off every two weeks. But I insist that they keep practicing because I meet really advanced teachers all over the world when I'm teaching uh, everywhere in the world. And I know those people don't practice every day. I can tell when they come to my class yeah. that they don't practice every day. I can tell instantaneously people who practice. So that's the first criteria. The second criteria is when you go to a, when you go to a meal with someone or you're out socializing and someone asks you what you do, don't say you're a yoga teacher. <laughs> don't ever try to say you're a yoga teacher. I never say I'm a yoga teacher. What do you I say? Think you people what can you guess. guess. People can guess. Yeah. <laughs> what do you I say? I look like a yoga teacher, <laughs> but I also look like a drug dealer to some people. Well. <laughs> if you go to if you go Don't to Big Town either. Festival, I got sick of asking people if I had any pills or weed <laughs> to sell. <laughs> if I got my hair up, so um, people ask me what I do, and I say I'm a plumber or I'm a labourer, and. Um, I don't admit to being a yoga teacher because I don't see myself as being able to be Yogacharya. And I think being Yogacharya to Indians means something much different than it means to people in the West. And it's really an honorable thing to be in India. And for these people to walk about calling themselves a yoga teacher after 200 hours, it's just an insult to all the Swamis and all the Yogacharyas and all the Rishis that have studied for 30 or 40 years in India hmm. and they're, they, they're still just being in service all day long every day they don't have any possessions they don't they don't need any possessions they have a, a life totally devoid of um, materiality whereas in yoga I know a lot of yoga teachers who have done 200 hours who smoke Marlboro drink red wine take cocaine and um, eat meat yeah. and there are yoga teachers who teach in London I know for a fact there are because I taught some of them yeah and that really disgusts me. <laughs> that really puts me off. Have you, had, pe have you oh. had people walk out of your class for being oh, yeah. so forward? Yeah. How not do you so manage? Much, not <laughs> so much nowadays. Because you sort of filtered out who the, yeah. your, your audience. Yeah, I've yeah. got better at losing <laughs> You've got a people. reputation now. <laughs> yeah. But some girls bring their boyfriends and their boyfriends think, oh, if she can do it, this is going to be really easy. <laughs> and you know after 20 minutes that they can't do anything and they're sweating and they're shaking. And I do say to them after 25 minutes, just sit down and watch. It's much easier just to watch. My teacher Hamish taught me just to watch for two months, uh, two weeks at first, and um, 
they take that as a bit of an insult. Yeah. And then at the end, if they stay the whole class, they say, you done really well. I would have left ages ago. I would have left. <laughs> I would have left after twenty minutes. You know what I mean? Like, what? So, do you really welcome the people that clearly can't do it? You kind of embrace them in a sense, as long yeah, as they're, if they're pushing yeah. themselves. Because I know what it's like. I had a quadruple fracture in my spine, and I was in a Royal Free Hospital for twenty-three weeks. I was in a wheelchair for the last fifteen weeks of that. So when I started doing a stanga, I couldn't touch my knees. Never mind my toes. So I used to go to the classes and feel really, really, really out of depth, out of my depth, incapable, useless. Why can he do that? Why can she do mm. that? And I can't do anything. And I know that if you come to the class and you don't know anything, it can be not just a humbling experience, but a really detrimental experience for mm. a lot of people. So I try to encourage people just to do what they can do, do it well, and don't pay attention to some of the other people who mm. have been with me for 18, 20 years because they know what to do, yeah. you don't. We were all a beginner. I always say everyone in this class was a beginner at some point. Everyone, everyone in this room was a beginner at one point, but we all put in hours of practice and hours of practice, and I tried to encourage them instead of just letting them leave. Yeah. Before I used to let them leave, but I would have that, you know, you thought it was going to be easy because yeah. your girlfriend <laughs> does it, huh? <laughs> you know, you thought it was going to be simple because it's just yoga and you, you've got loads of tattoos and you're macho and you've got your football strip on. <laughs> I used to just be quite happy when they left, but now I try to encourage everyone. Nice. Because I'm a bit older. But and that's a, a really mature. nice message to just ignore, in the kindest way, to ignore everyone else. Because what someone else can do with their body is irrelevant. It's irrelevant yeah, yeah, to yeah. your experience, isn't it? Yeah. Is it? We need to do some li tiny little quick fires now. So is there any book uh, or reading you think is particularly pertinent to the way yoga is going in, that, in the West, let's say, and right. something that would help pull people back into a, a truer path, we could call it? Um, a really simple book to read and a really useful book that I've always read and still read. There's two of them, and they're both by BKS Iyengar. And I always tell people to keep reading them for the rest of your life because they'll always work for you. And one is uh, The Tree of Yoga by BKS Ayenga and Light on Life. Mm. So one of them is about Ashtanga, the eight limbs, and it's explained as a tree. And the other one is about the koshas, about five sheaths, about the, the five koshas. They're both ghost written. So he didn't write both of them, but they're ghost written by really senior Ayenga teachers. Mm. So they're very, they're very clear, easy to understand. And um, that and all Jörg Fierstein's books are the books that I recommend to everyone to read. Um, and go back to all the time. In relation to modern yoga, I think every modern yoga book is a complete and utter waste of time. I wouldn't read. I wouldn't. I, I would never write a book on yoga. There are so many. I've not read half the yoga shastras. I've not read half the puranas. I've not read the Sanskrit version of Bhagavad Gita or Mahabharata. I've not read the Sanskrit version of uh, uh, Mundaka Upanishad. I want to. I want to stress to people that what you have in English is nothing until you understand it in Sanskrit. Because when you understand it in Sanskrit, then you understand how it's written. It's like reading John Paul Sartre in English <laughs> or reading some French philosopher in English. You have to read it in French. You have to read Gabriel Garcia Marquez in Spanish or Gunter Grass in German to understand what they're writing about, what their philosophy is. Reading yoga texts in Sanskrit is a completely different thing than reading it in a uh, translation by some super Oxford graduate philologist who's got a different social background from me and you. Mm. So I would say to people, don't read modern yoga books. They're usually a waste of time. If you want a book on postures, use Light on Yoga by BKS Iyengar. That's 210 postures that you'll probably never do them all in your whole life, but you might as well look at them and pretend you can do them eventually. <laughs> and um, don't bother about new people. New people, modern teachers... Uh, they're, they're just show-offs. <laughs> they show off. I used to show off a lot. I used to show off a lot. And people, wow, you can do that. That's amazing. Wow, you can jump into that. You can do you can do Dvipada Shashana and jump into handstand. I used to show off and now I don't show off. I refuse to practice in, any, in front of anyone. Mm. And I refuse to post. Don't ever post a picture on Instagram either. Because um, <laughs> that's just a sign of bogus teaching as well. You say you say that. I, I, Sorry, I, I I'm one of those. I'm one of those. <laughs> but uh, my my view is, you, 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 I bet so many people came to your class initially because they saw you do that. 
had it, had wanted to be like you to some no, degree. There was no, I don't have any Instagram. No, I no, but as in they could see, they, were, right. they in, in person, they could see that no, you could No, no, they, they were more influenced by what I had to say about yeah. politics. They were more interested in what I had to say about being a vegan and how veganism was so essential in yoga and the climate change and doing actions for everyone from Extinction Rebellion. I started with Reclaim the Streets was my first direct action. And then I was involved with uh, Hunt Saboteurs, Animal Liberation Front, Earth First. So more people came to my classes because they knew who I was as an activist because mm. I had done actions with them. I had freed rabbits. I had chained myself onto the, uh, the Westway. Some of my, a lot of people came to my class because they knew me about okay. that. And they knew me about writing it on MySpace. MySpace, bloody hell. MySpace. <laughs> so long before Instagram, there was MySpace. Before Instawank, there was MySpace. <laughs> and um, we used to do music and just chat about who we are and meet all our old friends. And there was BitTorrent and there was LimeWire so we could steal as much music as we wanted. <laughs> and then it all became the metaverse and it all became X. And um, there really is still an underground culture uh, on the internet if you want to try and find it. Uh, I do participate on the internet, but I, you never know who I am. You're never, on, ever, the, on the black web, web. On the, not the black web, on the dark definitely. web. Yeah, <laughs> and on uh, that note. On the, where can people find you? On Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> you on that. I, 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 <laughs> I pay someone to do it. <laughs> it's East London School of Yoga. Cool. On Instagram and then or on my website. It's and in person? Uh, I forget where they go. I don't teach many public classes. I teach four at Indaba in Marleybone and to a shishi new place that I'm not sure about in Shoreditch called Mission E1. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not too sure about corporate yoga and then I find myself working for corporate yoga <laughs> and it's very hard to, there's no co-ops in Britain. There's, well, there's two or three co-ops in Britain but I'm, I've tried quite a few times to start yoga co-ops and they've never worked. I tried years ago to start a yoga union and when they did start one, I was never really happy with it. So I just sort of resigned and cons Beside myself just to be sort of on my own and sort of not waste my energy try to get people interested in co-ops but I do have a big a big chip in my shoulder about corporate yoga maybe I worked for IBM for five years maybe that was part of it uh, but I do have a big chip in my shoulder about corporate yoga so I always find it quite contradictory that I work for places like Mission which sells meat which sells cheese, which sells dairy products, and is a corporate establishment by a hedge fund manager from the Cayman Islands. And I find that quite hard to live with, but then if I'm not there, I can't access the people exactly, that go yeah. there. Mm. That's, my, that's my reason for being it's there. You just, I, I, my view is always, whatever pathway someone has taken to get to yoga, even if it is goat yoga, not the dream, but if they did a goat yeah. yoga session and they thought, actually, yeah. I like some of the poses, yeah. maybe I'll try a class. Yeah, it's yeah. not the dream, but if it gets them in, and that's why I played music initially, because <laughs> it did, yeah, yeah. It, it did pull some people in. Of course. And then course. I, yeah, then yeah, I stopped. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you for your time. No, thank no, you, no. Guys. thank you, Stuart. Thank you so Thanks much for listening, everybody. Honestly, I'm balanced.